Terry, thanks for all the kind words and thanks for having me here. Uh, this is always a fun talk to give, first and foremost, because I love the technology. And I don't mean just technology in general, which I do, but the uh, microline technology. And today we'll talk about some of the anatomy relevant to the head and neck surgery that I do, for which I really found the um, microline technique just to be outstanding and the instrumentation to be outstanding. And then um, just some of the specific things that I think people can pass on when they are te teaching how to use this equipment, uh, you know, whether you're going in as representative of the company to look at it, or even just for others I teach, this is how I teach them. So we have a lot of information to cover this morning, but please ask questions. I do like to teach. I also like to talk, as people will notice, but uh, I do want to leave a lot of time for questions. So today, the specific topic is microline technology, head and neck surgery, because that's what I am. I'm a head and neck surgeon. I do a lot of cancer surgery, um, as well as benign masses, and that includes cancer and benign masses of the thyroid, parathyroid surgery, and you'll see a lot of that today. So let me move on here. So the head and neck surgery we find very unique because the anatomy is really complex. In fact, that's one of the main driving forces to why I went into this field. A lot of critical nerve structures and injury to those nerves, uh, frankly, in, in many cases tends to be permanent. So if you injure the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which can happen during thyroid and parathyroid surgery and occasionally during neck dissections for cancer, uh, the person will be hoarse. And if you actually injure both sides, the person will be unable to breathe because their airway will close. When we do surgery around the parotid gland, which is on the side of the face, just in front of the ear, the nerve that moves that entire face, the side of the face goes through the parotid gland. So when we do parotid surgery, we're really doing facial nerve dissection. And if that nerve is injured, particularly permanently, then you get something that looks just like a Bell's palsy. And most people know what a Bell's palsy looks like where the entire face is paralyzed, except if the nerve is cut, it's permanent. Uh, definitely we need smaller instrumentation. So most of the instruments that you see used in an abdominal case, even an, certainly an open case, but even the laparoscopic equipment is much longer and much bigger than what we use in the head and neck. So why does microline work so well when we're doing head and neck surgery or any surgery around nerves? It's safer than electrical energy because when you're in proximity to nerves, nerves are essentially wires and electricity will conduct to those, but unfortunately it will cause thermal damage. Now, certainly if you put the hot part of any instrument on a nerve, you can burn it and cause injury to that, but electricity will do it even if you're not actually touching the nerve. You will get arcs, you will get transfer of energy to the nerve that can cause temporary or permanent damage. Microline also allows me the ability to work in small spaces. I'm kind of notorious for making thyroid and parathyroid surgeries ex incisions extremely small and this instrumentation works out well. Uh, I found this to be a huge advantage over the ultrasonic devices which just really didn't fit in well or they only fit in on one side well but not the other. I use the microline ENT saps, and in case of the thyroid, the in cases of the thyroid, parathyroid, uh, actually most neck surgeries, the microseps. I tend to use the ENT saps more for tonsils, and I use it for dual purpose. I use it obviously for tissue division and vessel coagulation, but I actually use it to facilitate dissection using it in placement or, uh, um, of my debakey forceps. So in place of those, or in place of any of the grasping forceps I use. And that allows me a lot of ease of motion. So rather than reaching for another cautery instrument and putting my forceps down, which you would do with a standard bovi electro or the standard bipolar forceps or the ultrasonic coagulators, instead, I can just keep the forceps in my hand, using my left hand, dissect with my right. And when I come across a vessel, I can just divide it and keep moving. So it actually really speeds up okay. the surgery substantially. I think the first time that I was using this on a thyroid. I, I think I told Terry and uh, John that this probably took a half hour to an hour off the surgery because just a, it's a long surgery in this particular case and I wasn't constantly reaching for another piece of equipment or waiting for someone to hand it to me. So for those of you who don't know, the thyroid gland sits in the middle of the neck 
everybody knows about the thyroid gland because if you've ever checked out at a stop and shop or any of the grocery stores you always see that dr oz has some new cure for thyroid disease to help you lose weight and people are always talking about weight loss due to the thyroid well this is where the thyroid sits it is a i call it a bow tie shaped gland each side is called the lobe and then there's an isthmus in the middle which is a bridge sometimes a little lobe that comes off called the pyramidal lobe as well so this is how your thyroid sits and this is a normal looking thyroid behind and i want to uh really stress behind the thyroid are the parathyroid glands so even though this looks like they're on the top and there are four of them there's a superior and inferior on the right superior and inferior on the left this is a patient's right side this is a patient's left side here hopefully you can see my pointer and the voice box sits above that this is the cricoid cartilage if you've ever heard of a cricothyrotomy to open the airway it's done right there so the thyroid usually sits more over the trachea when it is a normal size a little closer view right thyroid gland or lobe isthmus left this is the voice box of the larynx this is the cricoid cartilage where there's some muscle this is the thyroid cartilage your adam's apple is there this is the uh, cricothyroid membrane and obviously there's the trachea that's a nice picture but this is more what we see so there's a lot of stuff in there as you can imagine uh, these are the great vessels coming off the heart that's the aorta right there We've got the uh, brachiocephalic vein and um, we've got uh, the brachiocephalic vein here as well. And then what we've got here are the carotid arteries going up. So the thyroid sits near the carotid, a lot of vessels going into the thyroid. Most glandular tissue has a lot of blood vessels to it. I have a lot of blood vessels to it. So these are the vessels that come into the top of the thyroid. We get those during the surgery. Um, a little more variable on the bottom or what we call inferiorly. This is an example of a pyramidal lobe. So a lot of structures in there. And this gives you an example of the recurrent laryngeal nerve as it comes up and it ends up going behind the thyroid on both sides right there. It's a little more variable in its position on the right. On the left, it actually tends to sit even closer to the trachea, actually right in here, close to the trachea. That's the recurrent laryngeal nerve right there. I'm sorry, this is the vagus nerve coming down, the recurrent and it is termed recurrent because it goes down and then recurs back up. So it goes down to the chest on the left and then comes up next to the trachea right there, very close and behind the thyroid into the voice box. On the right side, um, comes down, but it doesn't go down quite as far because it doesn't go around the aorta and that's re related to embryologic development. But here the nerve comes up and they do a nice job of showing that the nerve's a little more angle on the right. It's actually a little more likely to be damaged because it can kind of float in this area. You don't necessarily see it as well if you look right next to the trachea where it's almost always right there. So lots of anatomy in there. Interestingly, uh, if we do the thyroid carefully and especially using microlam, we don't get a lot of bleeding. So in spite of all those vessels. Again, just a little closer view. You can have some lymph nodes here. Uh, a little more of a view, although they didn't really show the recurrent laryngeal nerves here. But again, just how the thyroid looks. And it does usually have a lot of veins, as you see right there on the surface. So when we do thyroidectomy, there's really two approaches. Um, the first one is what I do. It's called a capsular dissection. And this is when you stay right on that capsule of the thyroid. So you are really right here hugging the capsule because the vessels are much smaller at that level. Uh, this is actually true with tonsils, interestingly enough. It's very similar in that concept. When you start to get out further, the vessels are much bigger. So we really stay right along the capsule, and usually as you come around the gland, that gives you a nicer ability to find the parathyroid glands, which can be very adherent to the capsule of the gland, and also the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which can be adherent as well. Um, so we do stay right directly on the thyroid capsule, as I mentioned, and uh, in that situation, you know, we can really separate the tissues away that are the important ones, parathyroid and the um, recurrent laryngeal nerve. What I learned originally in residency was more of the otolaryngology approach, which is what I call the recurrent laryngeal nerve dissection. So after initially exposing the thyroid, instead of staying right on the capsule, typically people will go down to the bottom of the gland or the inferior aspect and find the recurrent laryngeal nerve and then follow it up to the voice box. And while they're doing that, they lift the thyroid away from the nerve and they also find the parathyroid glands with respect to the nerve because there's some very distinct relationships between the parathyroids and the nerve. While this seems reasonable, in fact, when we do parotid surgery in the neck, uh, 
we typically find the facial nerve as quickly as possible and dissect right along it. Uh, there's a few issues I have with this particular approach, and I use this as a backup approach if we're really struggling to get a gland out because it's so stuck. Sometimes it is better to find the nerve down below and then trace it up, especially if the anatomy is really distorted by the size or by cancer invasion um, from the thyroid or just by a lot of scarring around it. So that's when I tend to use this approach if I've already tried to lift the gland and do the capsule, but that's not usually my common approach here because the recurrent laryngeal nerve is very thin. It doesn't tolerate the amount of dissection on it that the parotid does, the facial nerve does. So as a result, what tends to happen sometimes is if you spend too much time, you know, literally kind of banging around the nerve until you find it, <clears throat> you may find that the nerve doesn't function well afterwards, and that can last for months even though the nerve is still intact. So that's the approach that's typically been used, and as I said, it does resemble the dissection of a parotidectomy. So, you know, again, looking at these approaches, the capsule, you come right around like that, work around the gland, and as you lift it up, you find the nerve and you find the parathyroids behind it. The more recurrent laryngeal nerve approach is that as soon as you get the gland exposed, you come down here, find the nerve, trace it up, and then as you get behind the thyroid, you gradually lift the thyroid gland away. This is a picture of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, as you can see, it's a pretty small nerve there. So this is the thyroid gland. It's been lifted up. This is how the lobe looks when it's lifted. This is actually one of the parathyroids, uh, actually right down in here in this little area of fat. Uh, and this is another one right there. But this is the recurrent laryngeal nerve coming up, and that's where it's going into the voice box. These are some final attachments. So this is the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. This patient's left side where the fingers are trachea would be over in this area right in there. And that's how it goes in. It's pretty small. This is a, a little bit of a magnified picture there. So um, if you know the difference between linguine and angel hair pasta, this is more on the lines of angel hair, occasionally a regular piece of spaghetti, whereas the facial nerve is more like linguine, kind of flat and uh, you know a little bit wider. And I'm Italian, so I can relate to that. And Dr. Loretano, we have our first internet question here, and it is- Yes, please. Why uh, why are there space constraints on one side versus another and why the harmonic didn't fit so well? A lot of it has to do with the size of my incision. Um, and the space constraint is really the same on both sides. Uh, so I make a small incision and what I find is that when I put the harmonic in uh, using the forceps type or the focus or the focus plus, uh, it's just too bulky. It, it blocks my view. And then there's that hot side that you have to be careful about and the way I make my incisions, sometimes it can actually, uh, that hot side can lean up against the skin, either as I'm using the device or as I remove it. Um, so for people who use a much bigger incision, and some people use twice the size that I use, I mean, my incisions usually maybe, le it's less than two inches. Uh, you know, I don't think it goes beyond four centimeters. So, um, you know, so typically it's pretty small. I just found the device didn't fit well. Even if I was careful about not burning it, it just gave me a disadvantage in terms of being able to see past it to actually see the structures. And then the other thing is because of the curvature of that instrument, I found it worked better. If I stand on the right side of the patient and do both sides of the thyroid from the right side. My assistant stays on the left. You know, you try not to shift around too much during surgery. And, um, the focus on the right side is fine because it curves along the gland. You, know, you do most of your dissection on the side of the gland. When I go to the left side, it's actually curving away. And I found myself flipping it upside down. And then that takes a little bit of mental practice to remember that the buttons are on the different side. So for all those reasons, I just found it more cumbersome. The second part of the question is, what is your dominant hand? And is that the one in which you use microceps? Uh, my dominant hand is my right I do most of my dissection, but not all, with my right hand. So the microceps goes with my left, just as I would normally do um, when I'm using a um, forceps. Typically, the dissector is in my right hand, the forceps are in my left. If I'm going to cauterize something, I would then put the dissector down, grab the electrocautery or the bipolar, um, or the, I would use the focus, and then I would, um, you know, use that to keep the. Uh, keep the forceps in my hand so it doesn't mean switching equipment now 
I do um, also, I switch hands, and I can actually opt with my left hand as well. I think I started as a resident. I'm sorry, Art, hold on one second. Whoever just joined, if you could mute yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, so when I um, started doing tonsils as a resident, you're never supposed to cross hands when you're doing surgery, and I realized that it was actually better to learn how to operate with my left hand to take out the left tonsil. Um, also, sometimes an angle on putting tubes in kids can be difficult. So at a young age, I started using my left hand for those as well as my right. So I will switch instruments. Now, if I happen to be grasping a piece of tissue without the microceps, so I'll have a, a forceps in my left hand, and I do see a need to cauterize, I won't let go of that. I'll, I'll just use the microceps in my right hand. So that's a long-winded answer. My right hand is the dominant. Microcept tends to stay on the left. And I think I have some examples of that I'll show you. A picture of anatomy just to really show where the parathyroid glands are because we're going to talk about those so you know the parathyroid if you think of old film and you had the negative and then you had the actual picture itself and you know everything was kind of flipped around in terms of contrast and black and white but to some extent the parathyroid versus thyroid is the same idea when we do thyroid surgery the goal is to take the thyroid out either half or all uh, it depends on the indication and um, if one side's huge and causing symptoms and it's benign, you would just take out one side. If it's cancer and big enough, you would take out both. And there's all these guidelines. But when we take out the thyroid, our goal is to save the parathyroid glands. You only need one of the four to have normal parathyroid function. We'll talk about that in a moment. But ideally, we try to save as many as we can because sometimes surgery next to the parathyroid can stun it or prevent it from working as well. The thyroid gland makes a hormone that controls your metabolism. It stays in your system for a while, has a long half-life. The parathyroid glands make a hormone that controls your body's calcium level, and it only has a half-life of five minutes. So if you damage all four, or even worse, take out accidentally all four parathyroid glands uh, during a thyroidectomy or when you're doing a parathyroidectomy, then the calcium levels will drop rapidly, sometimes within an hour or so, and that can be dangerous to the heart. You can get abnormal rhythms to the nerves and the muscles, but particularly to the heart, of course. Um, you can get a lot of unusual symptoms with that. So it's something we try to avoid. So again, take the thyroid out, you leave the parathyroids. When you do parathyroid surgery, you lift the thyroid up out of the way without taking it out, and your goal is to take out the abnormal parathyroid glands. Now, in about... Um, 85% of cases, it's just one enlarged parathyroid gland. So what happens is, why do we take these out? They start to grow autonomously. They don't get controlled by the body. Uh, normally when the calcium level goes high enough, these shut down, and then when the body's calcium level drops for whatever reason, not ingesting enough calcium, something like that, then the parathyroid level goes up, helps to normalize the calcium level, helps you retain calcium, and then it settles down. Kind of like a thermostat in a way. You know, when the room is cold, heat comes kicks on as soon as the heat hits the temperature the thermostat set at the heat stops um but what happens is when these when one of these grows autonomously it just keeps making parathyroid it doesn't shut down and it actually pulls calcium out of the bone so you can get fractures kidney stones it can cause some mental status changes some intestinal problems now roughly i'd say five more percent so 85 it's just one about five more percent maybe even 10 It'll be more than one gland, but not all of them. And then probably about 5% or so, maybe a little higher. All four can be enlarged. And in that case, we try to take out three, three biggest. And then usually the one last one that's enlarged, you cut it in half. So you're essentially leaving behind attached to its blood vessel what will be a normal sized gland. So this is more accurate. This is the backside view, back of the trachea, where the cartilage does not go. This is a soft spot and actually the esophagus has been removed, the esophagus would be here. These are the parathyroid glands right there. They can really vary dramatically in position. They can be as up as high as the top of the voice box. Um, when they get big, they can actually descend down, and I have found them in the chest now near the aorta, so we do go into the chest to do this. Um, so it, it can certainly be in the upper chest. And what's interesting is that the top gland can sometimes fall down lower then the bottom one, and the way we determine which one is which, is the bottom gland sits superficial or closer to the skin with respect to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And the superior one is always in a plane or a level 
deep to or, or, or further away from the skin than the actual recurrent laryngeal nerve is. So no matter where it is, high or low, that's how we determine whether it's the initial, whether it used to be the upper or the lower one. So um, this gives you a view of what these things look like. This is the thyroid, a uh, little bit of a cautery area there. This is the thyroid isthmus going across. So this is a right thyroid lobe. Patient's head is up here towards the tidal. Patient's feet are down there and the clavicles right there. Um, and, and you know, honestly, this is a this is kind of a big incision for me, but it's also because I had to extend it to do the patient's neck dissection. Um, so anyway, here's the thyroid, here's the recurrent laryngeal nerve, there's the trachea, and in this situation, this gland is actually lying above or closer to the skin than the plane or the level of the nerve. So this is an inferior parathyroid actually sitting in its right location. I'm not taking this one out. This is a thyroidectomy, so we save it by peeling it away from the gland with the blood supply. This is part of the blood supply there, and this is part of it coming in attached, and we just cauterize those vessels with the microline uh, so we can get pretty close to the nerve because we're using the microline and still use cautery there and not have to use surgical clips or ties, which just speeds things up. If I do need to put uh, more of a closure on a vessel, then I will use the surgical clips. But that's what the parathyroid looks like, pretty small. Um, it's actually kind of caramel colored. It looks a little yellow here, but Coloration's a little off here. Usually the fat is kind of yellow, and this is actually kind of, it's just getting a lot of light on it, but it's usually kind of uh, caramel colored brown. So what are the approaches to both of these surgeries? Well, typically, um, you know, the instrumentation is we do tend to use nerve monitoring for this, for the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So what that means is that the breathing tube that's in the patient's throat and the airway, which we always do for general anesthesia in these cases, and we do them under general, has electronic sensors on it for the vocal cord for the vocal cord motion and the vocal cord nerves themselves so when we get near the recurrent laryngeal nerve or vocal cord nerve we can stimulate it electrically at a very low um, uh, level 0.7 milliamps sometimes even as low as 0.6 or 0.5 and the vocal cord will move for that particular side and we will hear a sound that says that's the nerve moving but also, we will see it on the monitor. We use an EMG um, type of monitor for that. So we'll actually see the nerve impulse working. There's a little bit of passive notification. What I mean by that is as you get closer to the nerve, the monitor does go off and make some noise, but it, it's not 100% as a passive. So you could potentially be right on the nerve and sometimes it doesn't go off. It's really meant to be active. And we don't like to overstimulate, so we really are careful um, about identifying it and then using the probe. Sometimes if the anatomy is really distorted, you actually will probe a little bit blindly to hear where the monitor goes off, and that gives you a ballpark of where the nerve may be. Um, we do use monopolar cautery. I, as soon as I make my skin incision, I use that to approach the gland, and I use it around the outer part of the gland until I'm getting a little closer to the nerves. Um, I don't use it, but some of my associates use bipolar cautery. I mean, I haven't used it since I used the microline. Um, Briefly, a few people became enamored with the ligature. Uh, the harmonic focus is a popular one, as we've talked about, and uh, focus plus shears, which are you know basically look like the scissors or, di or um, almost like a clamp. And then finally, of course, which is why I'm here, the microline microceps, which I like to use. Um, and Dr. Loratana, we have another internet question. Could you? Yes. Um, this question is: How much dissection time do you find yourself doing in thyroidectomy? Um, I mean, the surgery takes me about an hour to an hour and a half to do. And, you know, you're really dissecting the whole time. Um, you know, you just keep moving and move things along. So, I mean, a lot of it is dissection and then, you know, you stop to control some vessels. So, I mean, right up front, I'll say that I don't use the microline, as, as you guys know, to control the superior pole or those, those upper vessels and the inferior pole vessels because they're wider than... Um, I have a wider diameter than what the microceps are meant for, or even the ENT seps. Um, those I tend to put surgical clips on, titanium clips, because they're very quick to put on. Um, sometimes if it's a really big, what we call vascular pedicle, I'll actually clamp it and tie it. Um, probably the one few advantages of the harmonic is that um, people will use the harmonic across the top of the gland to cauterize those vessels because it does cauterize those larger vessels and has the indication for that. Um, for me, 
it's not worth opening that instrument and adding more cost to the surgery just for that one particular move on each side. Um, even the lower ones, uh, your vessels tend to be more separate from each other, not one distinct pedicle. Um, so it, I just find it more cost effective not to have that because I, I would never use the harmonic through the rest of the case. In fact, as I said, because of the size of my incision, I'd have to make my incision bigger just to get to those vessels. Um, but dissection, I mean, it takes me about an hour and 15 minutes to do a total thyroid and sometimes about 45 to do um, just a hemi or one side only. Uh, so I'm going to show you some of the surgical approach here. And um, this is a video that hopefully will work. I'm sorry, it's not high definition. So that is me controlling the inferior vessel. So this is a situation where the vessels are small enough. So as you can see, the right angle, which is my favorite dissecting instrument, is in my right hand. And I'm using the microceps right in my left hand to grasp. Uh, it just saves me a ton of time. I don't have to keep grabbing for another instrument. It gives me a good grasp on the um, thyroid gland that's separating some fascial tissue. And then as you can see, a lot of economy of motion here because I'm holding up with one hand, keeping it still, dissecting. Now when I have the dissector in place, I can just go ahead and use either micro line. Here's a good example where I'm using a clip. And I just, there were a couple of vessels here that I thought uh, needed to be clipped that tend to bleed afterwards uh, if you just cauterize them. But as you can see, I then switch back to micro line to cauterize the vessels on the gland there. So I just use the clip on one side a lot quicker. This is great for fascial tissue. It's great for small vessels. And um, this is why it doesn't take a long time to do this because, you know, you just have this economy of motion. I haven't really had to switch instruments yet except to grab the clips. And uh, so the lobe is pretty free there. Just attached really to the trachea. And that's the idea behind that. So in this particular picture, I've already gone, you know, I had already gone well around the capsule and freed it up. But what I really want, and that part I do a lot with the bovi until I get probably past what I would call the equator of the gland. As I'm starting to get to the deeper part further away from the skin, then you have to start looking for the nerve. Electric cautery can be dangerous in that area because it can burn the nerve or overstimulate the nerve. We have an equipment question that just came in. Yeah. Uh, HS, Ligasure, and Thunderbeat are very popular and in many cases contract driven. What do you tell surgeons on why you feel microceps is your preference? Uh, honestly, for a lot of the things I just described, um, I think first and foremost, uh, I love the idea of just the, the economy of motion. Um, it just allows me to keep moving without switching equipment. It's reliable, obviously, that's high on the list. Uh, you know, it works to cauterize the vessels, but the difference is that it doesn't work to cauterize the vessels. It, it's essentially working for me as a um, cautery forceps, you know, which it is. Uh, so my favorite forceps are the debakies. These are essentially the same size, the same shape, and just everything about them uh, works perfectly. You know, the one thing is they don't have teeth. We've talked about this um, in multiple meetings and, and, you know, have given some thought to ways to create that. So occasionally, if the tissue is really slippery, it will slip through. And then I will grab another set of forceps and go through that part. But that's usually not a majority of the case. In fact, it's very, probably 5% of the case, I would say. So I tell surgeons that it gives me incredible efficiency. Um, I like to demonstrate if they're willing to watch. So, uh, or I'll show them that video and show how I use it. Because a lot of times when I'm describing that, um, you know, well, I use it as forceps and they'll say, oh, I grab the tissue once in a while with the bipolar or with the ligature or one of those type of things. And then I'll say, well, this is what I'm talking about. And, you know, you're using it through the whole case. And then when they see that, they're like, oh, OK, wait a minute. That's really quick. That really saves a lot of time. So I think it's the reliability, the uh, time factor, it's very comfortable. Uh, as I said, I find the harmonic uh, quite awkward, actually, in terms of, you know, using it and um, used to use it on parotids a lot because there's more space on that. And then again, just found that um, as you get near the nerve, the backside of it is too hot. And with the micro line, um, you know, I can end up uh, flipping the micro line over. So the active portion is not sitting on the nerve. The inactive portion is and the inactive portion doesn't get hot. You can't do that with the harmonic. And I, I just find the micro line, as I said, a lot more easy to use when I'm doing a parotidectomy. I dissect right along the facial nerve with that right angle clamp that you saw, you know, without clamping, just dissecting and spreading. That sits right on the nerve. 
and then I lift the tissue up and cauterize it so it splits over the nerve, and then I can see the nerve further, and you just follow it like that. And if I have to dissect or cut tissue that's really close to the nerve, I can lay the microline right on it as well as, as far as, as long as, rather, the hot side is away from the nerve. So that's what I tell on, surgeons. Could you comment on the power settings you're using with the power supply and the forceps? So I use um, four for the neck, four for the thyroid. We'll talk about tonsils in a moment, and I use six for that. And that's really the settings I was recommended to use when I first started using it, and I have not varied from them. Not quite sure what the other settings do. It's uh, They could just be a four and a six. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, at this point, we'd like to take a pause in the presentation to allow people to go open mic and ask questions to Dr. Laura Tano directly. So if anybody has a question they'd like to ask, please feel free to unmute yourself and go for it. Dr. Lortano, I uh, wanted to thank you so much for uh, for doing this. It's been very informative. Um, quick question in regards to uh, a surgeon who, who may say it's great for dissection, but not necessarily for um, establishment of like an, on an anatomical plane. Um, would you say there's some um, consistencies with that or is it just surgeon preference? I don't know if I worded that correctly. No, I understand. First of all, thanks for your kind words. I love being here. Um, the second thing is that uh, it is surgeon preference. So some people like the harmonic because they will dissect with it. So much as I'm using that right angle, right angle clamp, as you saw in my right hand, they will use the harmonic for that, the focus shears, for instance, um, and they'll use that to spread much like a mosquito clamp or, or a regular snap or even a Jacobson or a Jake, one of the real small ones. So the idea is you put it in the tissue, you spread, and then in the case of the focus, you could take it out, turn it 90 degrees, put it across that tissue and um, coagulate it. And, you know, that's a very reasonable approach. But as I said, there's a couple of things that um, I have been unhappy with with that, which is where it does get the surgeon preference. One is I think the instrument's too big. Um, the right angle dissectors I use or some of the other dissectors are a much finer tip. So as you start to get really close to those important structures, I found the focus was too big to get into those areas. And as a result, I'm then up against them with the hot side, you know, as, as it gets hot. I mean, technically speaking, both sides are hot. It's just one side is the active side on the focus, but the other side gets hot. And um, anyone knows that because we tend to, you know, when we use an instrument, if we go to put it back to give it to the scrub tech, we don't take our eyes off the patient ever off the operative field. So sometimes you'll hand it back and you put it down on the patient's chest so especially where we try not to, you know, pass instruments directly, although that's not a sharp, but sometimes you'll put it down on the chest. And um, if it's the part of the chest that's exposed, that doesn't have towels or drapes over it because it's in the cervical field, uh, and you put that forceps on there, it, it actually burns the skin, and I've seen it. Um, so what it, that's what the focus. So what you end up doing is we have people put a wet towel on the chest and then we hand it off. And I'll tell you, when you hand it off and you put that hot side on that wet towel, you hear it go, tss. so there's definitely heat there. Um, so that's the reason I don't like it. And I think it, it it comes down to the fact that I end up finding myself using more instruments, also really having to make my incision bigger to be able to get it in there. Um, but it is surgeon preference. I, I like dissecting with the right angle forceps. I like uh, using the microline. Um, some of my associates use the bipolar and they have what I think is a horrible habit. In fact, when I work with the residents, I say there's a few things in my OR you should never do. And one of them is that they'll bipolar and then rather than get the scissors to cut the tissue, they'll tear it. They'll just pull it off with the bipolar. Well, the problem with that is it would be great in theory if when you use the bipolar to cut something, it because it doesn't usually cut, it just cauterizes, whereas the microline cuts on. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so when you use a bipolar, you have this area of char, they pull on it. It doesn't tend to break in the center of the char, leaving both sides of the vessel charred. It tends to pull the char off with one side and leave the other side exposed, and then they have to um, re-cauterize or re-bipolar. So that's another reason why I like using the um, microline, obviously. Now, the one thing I didn't mention was when I'm dissecting and I'm separating tissue, um, so I use coagulation mode. Uh, you know, which is the pedal on the left, 
and then um, sometimes that'll go right through the tissue. But if it doesn't, once I'm happy that I've coagulated and you just get a feel for it, you know, it's really a second or so, maybe two seconds. Then I switch to cut and it cuts right through cleanly. So I never tear. I mean, I, I, with the bipolar when I used to use that, I wouldn't tear, but then you had to ask for scissors. So you take the bi, you know, usually in that case, using the bipolar in your left hand, and then you hand that back to the scrub because you've got the vessels held up with your uh, right hand with the dissector. And then you either have to put the scissors in your left hand, and a little tricky to use scissors if you're left-handed, or alternatively, you have your assistant cut, uh, or you actually have to switch hands. So, you know, there's just inefficiencies with that. That's why a lot of people tear. And they get away with it sometimes. But so, again, it gets down to surgeon preference. And um, the micro line just fits right into my workflow. Uh, and, again, I, I neglect to say before, so I use coagulation mode first and then cut. If it's really thin tissue with no vessels in it, I can just use cut. Um, and just a quick story, you know, how did I come to this idea of using these as forceps? When um, John and Terry first introduced me to the micro line, and actually it was, it was John and... Um, uh, you know, way back when uh, first showed it to me, we, we talked about it for tonsils, and that was the thing. And then at one point, they said, you know, you can use this in the neck. And I said, wow, that's pretty cool. And I thought about it, and I think the first time I tried it, I got a lot of bleeding because I just wasn't used to it in the neck. And I always give things two shots. So I said, you know, I was thinking about the night before the surgery, and I said, how can I minimize some of the equipment on the field? Because now I've got the micro line. I think we were still using the harmonic back then or the bipolar or both uh, plus the bovi. So I came up with this idea that what if I use the micro line as a forceps and, you know, there'll be more efficiency of motion and uh, I can cauterize at the same time. So the next day when I came in to do the thyroid, and John and Terry were there. I just uh, started to do it that way. And, they, you know, they said to me, how'd you come up with that? Or, you know, where'd you learn that? And I said, I don't know, I just gave it some thought last night. It just stuck ever since. Um, so, you know, it's worked out really well. Any other questions on the thyroid? Oh, well, open mic. Sorry. Any other questions? <laughs> There's a question that came in off the Internet here, which is somewhat related to what you just spoke about. Um, yeah. Are there additional methods for hemostatic control that you might use in the thyroid bed and thyroidectomy? Absolutely. And do we still use drains? I do not use drains. Most people don't, but some people do. I can jump to that right away. I have a couple of associates who still use them. I look at a drain as a means to remove excess fluid and sort of that bloody ooze that you might get in any surgical bed. I do not use it to prevent a hematoma, meaning that if someone's actively bleeding from a vessel in the thyroid bed postoperatively, a drain is not going to prevent that. And in fact, usually what happens is if you have a significant bleed in the neck, it's going to coagulate that vein right away, the, uh, the uh, drain right away, the drain clots off. And, you know, if it's a vein bleeder, it takes a little longer and you may just notice that the drain is draining a lot. Uh, but if you didn't have the drain in, frankly, frankly you'd know faster because the neck would start to swell a little more. It doesn't prevent airway issues or anything like that. People say it buys you time. It doesn't buy you that much time maybe half hour at most. Um, thyroids just don't accumulate a lot of fluid in them otherwise. Uh, and then in terms of arterial bleeding, that expands very rapidly and can be, and they can be actually little, little arteries. There's a couple of little arteries right near the recurrent laryngeal nerve that you definitely have to get. Um, and if you don't, or if they you know, bleed afterwards, those can actually fill the neck up pretty fast, even though they're very small. I'm talking like maybe two millimeter diameter vessels. So that's the drain question. I don't use them um, in the in the thyroid. Like I'm doing a neck dissection today, absolutely will use it. There is no question about that, uh, especially in a radiated neck. They accumulate a lot of fluid, and if you don't drain it, it, interestingly, it just keeps forming. The skin will not adhere down to the muscle, and the tissues will continue to leak. But that's not the case with thyroids or parathyroids. And a lot of these patients I sent home the same day now. Um, so, you know, having a drain would also be a nuisance. In terms of hemostasis, uh, you know, going right down the line, the bovi electric cautery, uh, you can use it to cut and coag. So I definitely use it in places where I'm not near critical structures. Uh, once I make my incision, I use that for a big part of my dissection until I get down to the deeper aspects of the thyroid. We talked about the harmonic, the ligature, the bipolar. Uh, 
I like titanium clips for vessels that I think are a little larger than what the um, micro line would take care of. There's both small clips and medium sized clips. Uh, larger ones would be, I haven't really ever seen one to be honest with you on, a, on the applicators that we use, but those are very reliable. They're quick to put on. I actually use sort of the old fashioned small appliers because um, I can get much, much more finesse and they're much smaller. But uh, interestingly, we haven't had those lately, even before COVID. So I use one of those disposable um, types of ones, but they're actually a bigger device. And again, sometimes it can get a little tricky and sometimes they, they catch a little bit and you'll end up grabbing the vessel. But you know, that being said, I find that very efficient. And then sometimes you have to do a classic tie. You have to put some, um, uh, you know, actually put a clamp across the vessel and use ties. And I use silk ties. Some people use Vicryls, which are disposable, but the silks can stay in and the titanium clips by the way are, are safe that you can do mris with them in you can go through airport scanners which are always questions that get asked um in terms of at the end of the surgery i really try to make sure the thyroid bed is dry so if there are little oozing vessels um you know you can use like on the trachea say you can use the micro line you just put the tips together you put some pressure and use it on i usually use it on cut mode at that point and it just heats the air spot coagulation uh, if I see a little vessel that, you know, I can actually grab, I'll grab it between the forceps. Some people will put Surgicel or um, Fibrillar or things like that, which are these dissolvable hemostatic agents, and they'll just do it to pick up any oozing that might be there. I use it pretty rarely. I just have found that sometimes if you ever have to go back into a into an area, not just thyroid, but any place, and you put that stuff in there, sometimes it's a little bit uh, inflammatory. but you certainly can. I know a lot of surgeons who have been doing this longer than me, in fact, uh, and I'm 56 this year, uh, and I've been operating since uh, I finished med school 24, uh, when I was 24, so it's been a long time. Uh, but I know some people who continue to use it. Sometimes a little voodoo in it. We do certain things a certain way because it's always worked. And, you know, that's one of the things that sometimes gets surgeons uh, sort of set in their ways and not willing to try new things, at least until some of their more daring associates have tried it. Ironically, in my practice, I was the first one to adopt the microline, and the second one was my most senior associate who just retired recently. Uh, the guys in the middle were much more reluctant, interestingly enough. Other questions? All right. Do you want to take a break or do you want me to keep going? I think in the interest of time, uh, we'll want to keep going. Okay. Let's talk about tonsillectomy. So, as I said, my initial introduction to the ton to uh, the microline was the tonsillectomy using the ENT sets because they're a bit longer to get into the throat better. So this is some anatomy. Uh, let's show the front view first. These are the tonsils. They sit back here. A lot of people don't even know where they are unless they're really huge. So this is the uvula, a little punching bag in the back of the throat. There's just the tongue being lifted up. There's the tonsils, and from a side view, again, here's the uvula. This is the tonsil sitting right there. This is the tongue and the back of the tongue. There's actually something called lingual tonsils, which we don't routinely take out when we're doing a tonsillectomy for infection or for very large tonsils. This is the epiglottis. Those are the vocal cords we've been talking about, the true ones, and there's a little fold above called the false. Uh, this is the cricoid cartilage. Yeah, thyroid would just be a little off the page down over the trachea, and that's the esophagus there. A little closer up view of that side view, because a little hard to appreciate where the tonsils sit, but here's the back of the tongue. This is the palatal glossal arch, more commonly known as the anterior or front tonsil pillar. And this is the posterior tonsil pillar, also called the palatopharyngeal arch. There's little muscles in there. And the tonsil sits in the middle. You can see the visible part of the tonsil, but deeper in, I'll show in the next picture is where the uh, often the full part of the tonsil sits. So these are pretty good sized tonsils. It's actually a normal throat, no infection. Obviously, that's the tongue. Here's the uvula, soft palate, hard palate, the hard roof of the mouth begins up there. This is the visible part of the tonsil. And I say visible because you see right here, that's just all tonsil. This is the anterior tonsil pillar I just talked about. So this is all mucosa with a very thin layer of muscle in it and the rest of the tonsil lies under here so you have to picture that it actually goes out that far 
and around it sits what are called the constrictor muscles, which help you swallow, and particularly here, the superior constrictor muscles. When we do a tonsillectomy, we go around the capsule of the tonsil, which I'll show in a moment, and we separate the tonsil from the surrounding muscle. And although there's no important nerves in this area, there are some significant blood vessels as you get further out or further down. So much like the thyroid, your best bet is to stay right on the capsule. The vessels are the smallest, and you cause less injury to the muscle, uh, particularly less thermal injury. And the less thermal injury you cause, usually the less pain there is after surgery. And that's one of the things that drove me to use the microline because you do get less thermal injury there. So that's the position of the tonsils. They can be really small, but cause lots of infections where you have to pull them out, or they can be quite large and not cause any infections at all and just cause airway obstruction. Little kids who snore, it's always there in large tonsils and the adenoids which sit up in the back of the nose. Um, so you could have big or small tonsils and you could have them out for infection. Uh, or you can have really big ones and need to have them out for your airway. So again, what are the options? Um, these are the current options people use. I'm old enough that we actually used to use um, just sharp dissection. It would bleed a ton, uh, so you had to do it quickly, and then you would really put some pressure, stop the bleeding with that temporarily, and then you would look and find the individual vessels and tie them off. Um, very time consuming it or it could be if you weren't good at it the guys who had trained that way and that's all they did were actually really quick at it but it could be quite bloody the key with that was that there was no cautery uh and people would argue that there was less pain because there was no thermal injury with that if you go way back um it was usually a partial tonsillectomy in fact people did a guillotine tonsillectomy they used an instrument that just kind of clamped the tonsil and cut right through it in one move and then they would literally turn the patient's head over. This is one they used to do ether tonsils too, and just let the blood come out of the mouth and it would stop by itself. The key there was they're always leaving a little bit of tonsil behind. And when you're inside the tonsil and not dissecting around the capsule, you get much less bleeding. The blood vessels stop on their own. The disadvantage is you're leaving some tonsil behind. And sometimes it can grow back in those situations um, and can even get reinfected. Whereas when we take out the whole tonsil staying on the capsule, the tonsil will actually um, not grow back. So you hear this, you know, thing, tonsils grow back. Well, they do if you don't take the whole thing out. Uh, so that's the story there. So monopolar cautery, that was uh, the thing I most commonly used before I used the microline, uh, staying right on the capsule, mostly coagulation mode, a little bit of cut mode. Uh, we tried to lower the numbers as much as possible. I started doing tonsillectomies probably with a coag level of about 15, I'd say, um, you know, which is pretty low. And uh, I mean, I tend to use low settings anyway. And the NAC, we use like 20 uh, for cutting, uh, blend two, and 16 for coagulation. So blend two means on the cutting that the little coagulation with it. Um, but, you know, really have, have tried to go down substantially. But there was still a lot of pain with that. Bipolar is extremely inefficient. I know people who do it. We played around with the micro debrider for a while. The idea here was it was less painful. The problem with it was uh, it bled a lot. And um, you were doing a partial tonsillectomy because if you went outside the capsule, you cut into the muscle, you get tons of bleeding. Cobalation was popular for a while. Um, it, it, you know, it uses sort of a different type of energy and it's done under a saline bath. Um, for a while, I was enamored with this because it was le definitely less painful, no question. The data shows that uh, up until I used the microceps, I should say, or the ENT seps. But of the things I'd used thus far, it was the least painful, but it had about an 8% risk of re-bleed. When we take people's tonsils out, seven to 10 days out, the scabs fall off. And typically about 1% of people in our hands, in my practice, even less, will uh, bleed, and bleeding can mean going back to the operating room if it's significant enough. Um, with the coblator, we were seeing 8%, and what we were seeing was there were very small vessels. It was essentially the inflammatory tissue that heals that area called granulation, uh, but it tended to be oozy, and unfortunately, if you have a four-year-old who comes into the emergency room spitting out blood, you can't say, well, I think this is just small and it'll stop or I can hold some pressure. You have to go back to the operating room. So that wasn't ideal. We did try the harmonic with this, just as, you know, same idea as using the, uh, using it on the thyroid. The harmonic for tonsils, you can actually get in more easily um, because we weren't using the forceps type. We were just using the straight blade or the hook. Uh, 
but uh, very messy. It creates this funny plume, not of smoke, but of just kind of this water vapor. And uh, I still found it wasn't great for coagulation. Uh, most importantly, I thought it might reduce pain because of less thermal damage, but it didn't. And then the microline. So with the microline, as I said, my settings are six. And what I found was as I became more comfortable using it, it's staying right on the capsule, um, you know, really trying to make sure that you make your incision in such a way that the blood uh, stays away from the area you're working. There's very little bleeding with this. And as a result, uh, with the fact that there's very little bleeding and also no plume with this, you can really see your field very nicely. And you can stay right along the capsule. And so when I do a tonsillectomy, I grasp the left tonsil with my right hand, I pull it in towards the center of the throat, and then I use the microline to um, remove the tonsil. So it's really dissecting and cauterizing at the same time with the microline, kind of grasping the tissue between the forcep teeth and then uh, cauterizing that, mostly on coagulation mode. Occasionally I use cutting if I want to go through some tissue that clearly doesn't have any vessels that I've already cauterized. Um, and then once I take it out, again, you can do spot coagulation for little vessels right on the muscle. And if there is a vessel that's a little, um, a little more resistant to the spot coagulation, then I can cauterize with the electrocautery. But the difference is uh, now using coagulation mode on the monopolar cautery, uh, I can do it at eight. So setting of eight, which is really light, causes very little thermal damage. And I actually use a cautery that looks like forceps, uh, my monopolar. Actually, people think it's a bipolar, but it actually looks like forceps, but it's monopolar. And so I can grasp the tissue that's bleeding, pull it up, and cauterize it at a setting of eight, which is really inadequate if you were dissecting the skin or anything like that, but it's perfect for this area. Um, as I said, this is a surgery that's surprisingly similar to a thyroidectomy because you do a capsular dissection, you control the vessels as distally, meaning just as they enter into the um, tonsil tissue, uh, not further out near the muscle where they tend to be bigger and require more cautery. And then you do avoid critical structures. They're not as upfront as they are on the thyroid, but there are some larger vessels out to the side. And if you got really lost and deep into the tissue, you could get into the nerve that move, that gives sensation to the tongue, the lingual nerve, or um, a nerve near the palate area that can cause the glossopharyngeal nerve. These injuries are very rare. But if you do get down to the bottom of the tonsil and you get a little lost and go too far into the muscle, uh, which can actually happen with the electrocautery, you can get into a branch of the facial artery that goes up to the um, tonsil or uh, worse so into the carotid artery. And people have reported that happening or into some of the big veins um, that come up through the neck next to the tonsil. In worst case scenario, people have actually had to have their neck open to tie off those vessels in an emergent situation. And that can also happen seven to 10 days out. But usually in those situations, it means that vessel was probably encroached upon or very close to during the surgery. So, Dr. Loretano, we have a couple of internet questions that came in just now. Sure. I'll, I'll speak to yeah. a couple here. Uh, the first question is, can you speak further about patient, uh, patient pain response from microline versus other methods? Yes. So, overall, I have found um, pain to be much less since I've been using the microline, as have my associates who have used it. Now, I think we've actually been using it around five years or so, if I remember correctly. and. Uh, Definitely much less pain in adults as well as kids. Kids tend to have much less pain with this. Adults um, tend to have more. Now, that doesn't mean it's pain-free. Nothing is pain-free with tonsillectomy. Anyone who tells you tonsillectomy is pain-free, they're not taking the whole tonsil out because uh, then that is much less painful. But the reality is that um, I would say a, a certainly a much higher percentage of my patients report they had no pain or little pain, uh, or certainly less than they had anticipated by far. So pain is very subjective. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's just extremely difficult to pin down because people have different pain tolerances, even for different types of pain. You know, I have patients come in after a tonsillectomy or um, a more extensive sleep apnea surgery who have said, this was so much more painful than when I had my baby, you know, things like that. Um, but on the other hand, we hear a lot more of this was nowhere as bad as, you know, when my sister had her tonsils loaded at the same age or that type of stuff. And we watch their behavior. What I see with microline tonsillectomy is that um, people are eating and drinking much more quickly afterwards than they would with the standard um, electro, uh, bovi electrocautery tonsillectomy. 
uh, you know, that they were, they felt they were back to normal eating more quickly, although we do limit them to a soft diet for 10 days anyway. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that when we've looked now, have we actually published and done statistical data on this? No, not in our practice, but I think just looking at overall things that the average practitioner would look at, how many phone calls did I get on the patients I use the microline on? Uh, in my case, I realized that, you know, compared to before I was using this, um, I got a lot, a lot of few phone calls around pain meds, around uh, which is key because now we can't give narcotics to kids less than 16. Uh, we do use Motrin now, which we didn't used to, but that's been kind of the offset there uh, to not being able to use opioids in kids. And we're really trying to restrict opioids in adults. And, you know, what I find now is the people who call for more pain meds, I could have almost predicted preoperatively that they were going to be people who are not going to tolerate the pain well, uh, just from things they said about their pain tolerance. So overall, I find it to be much less painful. Um, not that there's no pain, but that I have a lot more patients coming to say that wasn't so bad. I have a procedural question. Does yeah. intracapsular tonsillotomy offer any advantages over tonsillectomy? Less pain. So that's when we talk about the intracapsular basically leaving a little bit behind. Um, yes, if you can get right on the capsule on the inside and stay right on it, um, which I think is a little harder to do uh, than being on the outside of the capsule and separating it from the muscle, which looks very different than the tonsil. In fact, as you get in towards the tonsil, if you go to the capsule, the tonsil bubbles a little bit. So I think the thing I used to find when I was doing tonsillotomy, when we were doing it with the debrider or doing it, um, you know, I, I've used multiple methods to do that was, I always felt I was leaving a little bit behind and I was, I mean, you would, you would see that and you'd have other surgeons tell you the same thing and they'd say, oh, I get it all out. But you really don't because you end up getting to that point where you realize, all right, I'm very close to the capsule. Am I gonna potentially, you know, um, end up going through the capsule and causing some bleeding, which really defeats the purpose in terms of decreasing pain and bleeding. So, you know, there are areas where you tend to pull away a little bit and say, all right, you know, I, I might end up leaving a little there. I've just seen other patients who have had it done. I've watched other people do it. And I think you always leave a little bit behind. And there's always that risk of it growing back. I think with small amounts, it may not. You may cauterize some of that and scar it down. But I think the problem is that people always get a little conservative and leave some behind. And, and what's the difference between operating on the outside of the capsule and the inside? The outside of the capsule separates really nicely in most cases, even with lots of infections in the past uh, from the surrounding muscle. Whereas when you're on the inside, the tonsil is very adherent to that capsule. Uh, it would be the same thing as if I tried to dissect the very thin capsule uh, away from the thyroid, you know, and, and actually got in, it would bleed a ton and, and uh, I just wouldn't really separate all the thyroid tissue out. Capsule is a little different on the tonsil from that standpoint. It is possible to dissect along the inside of the tonsil and a tonsil capsule and take most of the tonsil out. But I just feel like people are always leaving some behind. Uh, pain, definitely less, but, you know, regrowth is the problem. When we were doing tonsillotomy with the debrider, we um, were, you know, basically leaving a little inside. Uh, and what we started to do is we really used it just for people who didn't have infections, but more just hypertrophy and enlargement of the tonsil. So really your sleep apnea patients. And you would do a tonsillotomy. You'd take down as much as you could. Uh, the micro debrider was quick with that, as long as you were careful not to accidentally go through the capsule. But, you know, I realized you could do it with a cautery, you could do it with whatever. You could use a micro line for it, um, you know, if, if you really needed to. Uh, if you really wanted to do tonsillotomy, you could still do it with a micro line, just stay inside the capsule. But um, I found that some of those patients would come back years later and say, I'm getting infections now. And I'd have to go back in and take up the little bit of tonsil that was there. So, you know, yes, we were taking it out from large tonsils in the past. Now we were back in there. And redoing tonsils, and I've had to do revision tonsils on other patients, patients, uh, other people's patients, um, you know, where they had this done. I, I kind of abandoned tonsillotomy very early on when I started doing it. But, you know, going in and a previously done tonsillectomy is not ideal. I mean, you do have to find the capsule, but it's more scarred. Once you find it, you can take it out. Thank other you. questions? Is this a video you're about to show or should we take some more questions? No, unfortunately it's not. Um, I actually don't have a Tons Likely video that, you know, they're, they're so common that I never videoed one, which was a mistake. <laughs> I need, I really need to get one for this lecture.
No, this is a good time to take questions because then I'm going to talk about some of the things I think are important in terms of, you know, getting back to the earlier question. How do you tell a surgeon that, you know, this is something to really use or consider at least? Sounds good. So we'll take a few more questions then. Uh, one question that's come across, could you talk about the challenges that the obese patient presents in either of these procedures? Uh, multiple. So, you know, quickly, obviously, they have increased risks in terms of all the other medical problems they have. That's a given. With respect to thyroidectomy, um, there is a uh, Typically, uh, you know, it, it's a neck that is obviously very large, has a lot of fat or adipose tissue in it, um, but sometimes almost presents itself as a shorter neck. And so there's less space, you get the sense there's less space to work. Um, you know, I still try to make my incisions small on those patients. The thyroid is much deeper because you're going through much more soft tissue between the skin and the thyroid itself. And so sometimes I do find I have to make those incisions larger. Um, and I think that's really the big thing. It's about exposure. Uh, you know, it's about getting down into that area to close it up. I also think, um, and this is important in those patients, is that it is a little harder to monitor for hematoma because they already have a large neck. And one of the things I have found over the years is that I will get phone calls typically from um, like uh, if I do a thyroidectomy during the day and the patient's going to stay overnight, um, it's usually the nurse who comes on shift later who looks at the patient's neck and says, I think the neck is swollen and they'll call me up. Now, the nice thing is we have secure messaging technology that people can actually send me a picture of that and it doesn't violate HIPAA. Um, and that's key because I can look at it and say, oh, no, 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 that's how this patient's neck looks. But that is definitely a challenge. Um, the other challenge, which is where it becomes a challenge with tonsillectomy as well, is that the obese patient um, often, not always, but often has sleep apnea. And in sleep apnea, the airway is much more collapsible. And what we'll see is that when you go to intubate, you know, put the breathing tube in at the beginning of either of these procedures, uh, there is more of a risk of getting it in because it's a little harder to visualize. Um, everything tends to collapse back more. And so that the reverse of that also happens in terms of when you're at the end of the surgery and you know things are kind of relaxed back there from the sedation. Uh, in the case of tonsillectomy, we use muscle relaxant. I should have mentioned that in thyroidectomy, anytime we're monitoring for nerve function, you can't use uh, muscle relaxant during the surgery. Meaning the medications that you know paralyze the muscles so they don't move when you're doing the surgery, they don't jump with the electrocautery. It tends to relax the tissues, make it easier to cut. You can't do that on thyroidectomy because then you could cut right through the nerve and never know that you did it because it wouldn't stimulate the muscles. Tonsillectomy, you can. It actually helps open the mouth if um, you need to. Using neuromuscular blockade or paralysis or muscle relaxant sometimes will um, lengthen the surgery. If you tell the anesthesiologist it's going to take an hour and then you're done in a half hour, They'll say, well, I gave them an hour's worth of, uh, you know, muscle relaxant. I used a longer lasting one and you're waiting around. So they don't always use the relaxant in there. Um, but, uh, you know, so so the obese patient does prevent, uh, it does present an airway challenge. Um, occasionally, the challenge in tonsillectomy will be not even that the patient's obese, but their mouth doesn't open well. They have jaw issues or they just have a small mouth or... They may have a really large tongue. So yes, we do see obese patients tend to have more fat around the tongue muscles, tends to push the tongue back, um, and more fat around the throat, which pushes the tonsils together. That's part of that airway collapse issue. But add to that the fact that um, some people just have a really huge tongue or really what we call redundant tissue back there, just a lot of extra tissue that you have to work through. We do tend to find that more in obese patients, but occasionally just in your really bad sleep apnea patients as well. Um, so, yes, a lot of challenges there, obviously, with um, adult onset diabetes related to um, obesity. Uh, those patients don't heal as well. I haven't really seen it affect tonsillectomy. Occasionally, it can affect thyroid incisions, which is why I like to make those incisions small, but definitely can create some blood sugar challenges before and after surgery that you have to watch for in those patients. Next question comes from a rep yeah. who I think uh, clearly is calling on teaching institutions. Do you work with residents? If so, yes, what do. is the learning curve for a thermal forceps technique? Do they present an additional safety concern in the hands of the residents to the procedure as opposed to other devices? 
Uh, no more of a risk than any other device in a resident's hand. Um, in fact, my mentor, Dr. Bill Silen, used to say the most dangerous instrument in the uh, intern's hand was the suction. <laughs> and he was right, because people will stick the suction all over the place. And I've had residents put the suction almost on the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which will damage it, at least temporarily. Um, I do not find uh, any increased risk with this. In fact, again, I'd probably say less because unless they're grabbing a nerve with this, they're much less likely to, to burn the nerve than they would with the monopolar cautery, the bipolar cautery, or um, the hot, you know, basically the harmonic. Uh, so I think that that's uh, less of a concern for me. I, I think the biggest thing with the microline is the learning curve. I think that um, it's very foreign to them, you know, because a lot, not everyone's using it. So I think, you know, certainly when I work with the residents, um, you know, I'm one of the few who uses it at the residency programs that I teach at. And as a result, uh, they haven't seen it. And so they'll do a few things with it. They'll struggle a little bit with the settings. Um, they will uh, struggle a little bit with the pedal, which happens anytime they use a new piece of equipment. They will uh, try to do the tear thing that they do with the bipolar, which I don't like it with the bipolar. I don't like it with the micro line either. I don't think it's you know any more or less effective. Um, so I think it's just that. I think it's just a matter of getting used to it. It's a matter of getting used to the pressure that you apply because the micro line is a bit um, you know pressure dependent. Obviously, you don't just use the pedal. You have to squeeze it together to make it work, which I like. I think it's a great part of it. Um, you know, is that uh, you really have that double control of having your foot on the pedal and um, you know putting it together so you don't accidentally injure anything but it, there was definitely a learning curve let's ask one more question for this question break and then we'll move on to the last portion of your presentation okay. this is an administration question are there any financial drawbacks across the various cases and if so how do you justify so anytime we use disposables we're going to be spending money um you know the the most cost effective way to do a thyroidectomy or anything like that is, well, most cost effective way is scalpel, scissors, and ties. Um, obviously, it's going to bleed and it's going to take you longer. So then you have to take into account anesthesia time and OR time and all that type of stuff. We don't do it that way, obviously. Um, you know, the next most cost efficient would be to add the electrocautery into that, the monopolar or the bipolar. So you're, you know, the, the, monopolar, the wand is not that expensive. Obviously, you can't use it as you get near the nerve. Bipolar is not disposable, so you save some costs there. But you always have to offset that with how long does it take you to do the procedure? And for me, it's so much faster with the microline that the money that, you know, money spent on disposables, which is the same with the harmonic, same with a lot of cases we use disposables. That's where your costs really lie, um, you know, to the hospital. And then obviously you have to look at how much the billing for the surgery offsets that and, and pays for that as well as gives you some margin. But um, the reality is, there's also the you know the surgical time and and, and um, anesthesia time as a result. The longer you take during the surgery, the longer patients under anesthesia, the longer they take to recover. Just all those things actually add into administrative costs. And so you know, time of surgery I think is sometimes something that's neglected when people look at those costs, um, and you really have to add that factor that in. So I, I don't find that the cost of the disposables is, is egregious compared to what we save. And I, I can't rattle the cost off the top of my head, but you know, most of the equipment I've mentioned, short of the regular monopolar cautery and the bipoles that are reusable, um, they're all pretty comparable, you know, in terms of, of what the cost is to the system itself. Um, so that's how I feel about it. Thank and the you. other thing is, by the way, like I said, you know, if you're using multiple pieces of equipment and multiple disposables, then it, it gets to a point where, or even if you're using the bipolar that's reusable with the processing on that, all those type of things, um, at some point you just have to say, all right, which of these pieces of equipment can I no longer need or no longer use? And in my case, although the Michael is that the disposable and the bipolar is not, the time savings was huge and the safety close to the nerve, which you don't have even with the bipolar. You know, it's a fallacy to think that because the bipolar only provides thermal energy or, or, or electrical energy between the tips, you know, it's a fallacy to think that you can use it right on top of the nerve. Of course you can't. I mean, it's, it's, you know, if you're that close to the nerve, you're still going to stimulate, there's still going to be some arcing potentially. 
or what I call arcing, unless you can have thermal damage there. Very good. Uh, keeping an interest or keeping an eye on the clock, um, shall we proceed to the next portion of the presentation? And then if we have time, yes. we'll get to one last question and answer session. Yeah, let's move on. This probably should be relatively quick anyway. So why do I use this thing? Well, I'm a believer. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I'm not uh, somebody who will use a device and become enamored with it because it's new or, you know, because someone takes me out for dinner or something, which these guys did not, which was good for this kind of person. We eventually did, but <laughs> not to get me to use it, that's for sure. John and Terry can attest to that. And I'm blanking on the other guy's name who originally came. Um, but uh, it's just worked. I mean, and as I've played with it and tried different things with it and worked with it in the lab, um, it just has been reliable and has not failed me. I've been really happy with it. Um, I did want to talk about some additional neck anatomy where I use this because I've referred to this a lot. Um, this is a neck dissection. I'm actually doing one of these at 3 o'clock today. Uh, you've got the vagus nerve, carotid artery. These are some arteries going over towards the voice box. Um, digastric muscle. He has a hypoglossal nerve that moves the tongue. A lot of stuff in there, which is why I like head and neck. It's a bigger dissection. This is a patient who had a huge cancer on the parotid gland. As you can see, I take off part of his ear. He's not an elf. That's what his ears actually look like when I was uh, done taking half of it. Vagus nerve that goes down to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, ultimately goes to the chest and the stomach. Carotid artery, the jugular has already been taken out because it had cancer. This is all a cleaned out neck. Hypoglossal nerve, the jaw is up here. This is the facial nerve. So the facial nerve comes through, like I said, it's kind of flat and it gives all these branches up to the eye, to all motion of the face. If you cut this branch here, the other branches don't make up for the eye, the eye won't close. So that's what we do there. A bonus video. So this is the technique I'm talking about in the neck. Um, this is me separating tissue with my favorite instrument, the right angle, my favorite dissecting instrument, cauterizing with my favorite cautery instrument, the micro line. And as you can see, in this case, the tissue here is very thin. So what I'm doing is I'm clamping, I'm cauterizing, then switching over to cut, and just really drawing right through the tissue, which works really nicely for me. And um, this is moving very quickly because I have not yet switched out an instrument. I'm uh, just moving right along. This is what I'll do today, separating the skin away from the muscle here and just, um, you know, going right through. And even to some of that tougher tissue there that you see, um, it just, you know, cuts right through it nicely. And as you can see, some of that tissue really opens up beautifully here. And then the micro line just goes right through it. So that's been my technique to do this. Um, you know, and it just gives me huge amounts of speed in the neck. And it's, it's finesse dissecting. It's not just bovying through or electrocauterizing through. Um, this is me operating, uh, taking the tumor right off of the um, carotid artery, vagus nerve area. So, uh, you know, these are very important structures that obviously we don't want to injure, so I separate them and then um, just buzz them, just cauterize them, and there you go. So that's how we separate all that off. It's actually a pretty big node. I know it looks like thyroid, but this is actually a neck dissection. Voice box is over here, and you can see I'm working right along the arteries and vessels there, separating it off, doing a little dissection right with the micro line. So I switched hands here because I have one hand holding the tumor, and the other one is separating the final um, attachments of the tumor there. Some tissue is a little thicker. The guy I'm operating on today, he's radiated, so he'll have a lot of scar tissue in his neck because uh, he's already had radiation. But you can see how nicely this divides. So, so let me get to the question. How do you get people to use this? Um, this is my general feeling about docs, not just uh, with equipment, but anything. Physicians see change as a threat, as do a lot of people. But, you know, I think that we tend to be set in our ways. Um, just a lot of changes. I, I still mention the electronic medical record. Most people say that is the single greatest change that's happened to um, all of us. There was a thing called meaningful use, which had to do with uh, Medicare and meeting certain measures, reimbursements are down, increased certification. At the time um, when ICD-10 came out, which is a new coding scheme, just we had a huge stress. Docs have biases, even when data is presented to them. If you tell them a study showed X, Y, and Z, 
if it comes from an institution they like or people they like or sort of favoring their own biases, they'll say, oh, yeah, that's great. And if not, they'll say, oh, that data is suspect, you know, even though they haven't looked at it. They often believe they could have made it better. I had an associate like this. I talked to him yesterday, in fact. And um, if you wanted him to use something or even just take an idea, you usually presented him the idea, expected him to shoot it down, tell you how he would make it better, and then eventually you'd come back around. We're superstitious, uh, a lot of voodoo in terms of, well, I always do it this way because I've never had a problem. And I think in general, we're pretty stubborn. Um, this is the other thing. Sit in a room with a group of doctors and everyone is thinking that they're the smartest person in the room. I have no question about that. I'm sure I've thought that myself. Uh, Admiral Grace Potter. We are Admiral Grace Hopper, I'm sorry, Hopper. Uh, the most dangerous phrase in the language is, we've always done it this way. And that applies to not just doctors, but all business. Um, you have to be willing to look at things to change. And I have associates who are still doing tonsillectomies the way they did when they did it in residency. Uh, no exaggeration. One of my associates was a year ahead of me in residency. He's still doing tonsillectomy the way we did it at Mass Eye and Air where we trained. So uh, that is the thing that tends to happen a lot. So you have to show them the positive points. Uh, eliminates the need for other equipment. I use it as a debakey force. That's to limit switching of instruments, which definitely conserves motion if you've read, you know, how do physicians get better. Uh, Atul Gawande's book, Better. He talks about, I think it was Dr. Osteen, who, you know, I used to work with um, Dr. Osteen down at the Brigham and Women's in Boston, where I was before I came up here. And um, sometimes you actually will have someone observe you in the OR and tell you ways that you could do things more efficiently. And that's what Atul Gawande did and wrote about in his book, Better. Um, and one of the things we talk about is economies of motion. It actually saves you from wear and tear on yourself, reduces uh, use of equipment, reduces OR time, which is key. And really, for all the reasons I mentioned, it's better for the patient, um, just decreases uh, expense to the patient, expense to the system. Safety and proximity to nerves and other vital structures, and as I mentioned, skin safety as opposed to the harmonic. Um, I don't like using it for the superior thyroid artery, as I mentioned. I tend to clip it or tie it. There is a learning curve, so these are some of the caveats, warnings, you know, downsides. Learning curve, I think it was pretty quick. Foot pedals reversed. Most uh, Bovee foot pedals, most people don't use the electrocautery foot pedals anymore, but where I trained, uh, we did, and still sometimes we'll find one that you have to use because there's no buttons on the cautery. Um, those are pretty rare, but most of us still remember that on most foot pedals, the cut is on the left and the coag is on the right, and that is switched on the micro line. Um, you have to avoid pulling or tearing, uh, which is a technique that is also used with the bipolar, but is also wrong. Uh, I always emphasize coagulation first, then cut, unless I'm on really avascular tissue, some of that tissue I showed you in that neck dissection, just didn't have any blood vessels in it. Um, this hasn't happened lately, but when we were first using it, we used to warn the scrub techs that be careful wiping the tip, because if they pulled it, sometimes they would pull a little white protective piece off that stays on the, um, the, the non-heat side, um, the white side. And, that would be a problem and occasionally early on a couple fell off right into the patient we saw them which was great but still we've avoided that so um i did have a video here that doesn't really work but the point of it is I, well i can show you the video but there's no sound it was an ad for um it was during the super bowl i think it was merrill lynch uh company but the point of it was that this guy says he's been um hurting cats that's what working with docs cats they go in multiple directions um, they all will you know try to if you sit in a room with a bunch of doctors they'll all try to talk over each other I'm, a, I'm guilty of this as well make sure their point gets out there um, try to tell you how their idea is a little better than another person's and, and you'll see you know if you're talking to a bunch of surgeons at one time you might see that if there's a couple of rifts between some of the surgeons, one of them will take the side, yeah, this equipment's great, and the other one will right away take the other side. It's about patience. It's about, you know, when, when I ask anyone to use a piece of equipment that I like or um, say I'm designing, I typically will, it's funny, I don't know where I learned this, but it's almost like a sales technique. You kind of put it in the hand, essentially, and I don't say, hey, this is the best thing since sliced bread. This is a phenomenal piece of equipment and you should be using this. I'll typically say, hey, we've been using it for this. Um, be curious if you'd like to check it out. And I'd honestly be interested in your feedback. You know, are there things you would change, things that would work differently? 
And uh, for some reason, that's just a much more enamoring technique to um, get surgeons to use something versus to say, hey, you need to be using this. Um, I know one rep, not with your company, thank God, but um, I, I just couldn't stand even having to bring the equipment in because he would just start name dropping and saying, oh, this person's using this, or that person's using this, and you should be using it. And half the names he would mention were people, I was like, well, you know, that doesn't, you're not selling me. <laughs> you know, any more than I would want you to tell them that I'm using it. Just, you know, tell me the high points of it. Um, fortunately, his equipment was not something we liked anyway, which was good. Any questions? Dr. Loretano, thank you for a very informative presentation. At Great. this point, we have about six minutes for open mic question and answer. If anybody would like to ask Dr. Loretano a question directly, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. And by the way, very quickly, thank you, John. Greg Thompson. Greg was one of the first people who worked with us in the OR, along with John. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Hey, Dr. Lauren Tano, this is John. Just uh, one quick qu uh, comment, if I may. If I recall correctly, um, you, when you were able to really start to use the, uh, the microceps, and you were saving time that you actually were able to add a couple more procedures during the course of the day. Am I correct in that? Oh yeah, it definitely took time off. There was no question. I mean, it, it got to the point where, and it is at that point where, you know, people were saying to me, I mean, frankly, I, I do these with my first assist. I actually very rarely do these with my associates, um, but we used to do a lot of these surgeries jointly with our associates and just for, interest of time and OR scheduling efficiency, I stopped waiting for my associates to be available. And, you know, nine times out of 10, I would be doing the whole case anyway. Um, but when I started to book these surgeries using the micro line, I was still booking them for the times that we would normally do. So say a thyroid, I might book it for two hours or two hours, 15 minutes to allow for equipment change and stuff like that. And I was finishing them in an hour. And it finally got to the point where they said, your thyroid just don't take that long. You know, you're so quick, um, sometimes 45 minutes, that we realized, okay, we can actually book more cases. You know, my, my average time to do these, which we track, um, was fast enough that I could put more on. You know, because some people say, oh, you know, that thyroid's only going to take me an hour, um, so you can put a second one on, and the OR will say to them, well, no, we look at your average. You're actually three hours per thyroid. You know, you're not going to add another one on. It's not going to take you just an hour. You've never taken just an hour. Um, but in my case, it was like, these are much faster now. You know, you're, you're really getting fast with these. Same thing with the tonsils. Tonsils got fast because it wasn't that much bleeding with them. So, you know, it, it just got to the point where we could book more cases, which is better for patients because you can get more patients in so they don't have to wait as long for surgery, better for the OR, um, you know, because you're using their time efficiently and, you know, you don't get that backlog of cases that's problematic, not just for the patients and the surgeon, but also for the operating room. So yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. Dr. Lortano, it's uh, Mitch again. Um, hey. What would you say to, hey, what would you say to a surgeon that would, would call my fusion um, kind of big and bulky uh, in regards to a parotid? We, we've done multiple parotids on an eval. Um, at the end of it, he just said it was big and bulky. And it was interesting because I heard you say that it's not as big and bulky per se as a harmonic uh, scalpel. Um, once again, is that just preference or is there, a, is there an answer there? <laughs> I think it's just preference. Okay. okay. I mean, I, personally, that's what I think. Sometimes it's incision size, things like that. I would say for parodids, though, that um, you know, most of us make a – that's a pretty generous incision. The mistake you make on parodids is if you make too small an incision, you can actually – you know, some people think they can do it through a keyhole and end up cutting right through the nerve. Um, so I don't – you know, I, I, I think that's just preference. Hello, Doctor. Hello. Uh, so I have one question regarding uh, the adenoids. Uh, so some surgeons. Uh, oh, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Go yeah, ahead. Prefer, I, I can't trust prefer, my mind. I forgot. Oh, yeah. Uh, so some surgeons prefer coblation uh, because they can do both the tonsils and the adenoids. Uh, so that we can. That's that's the main problem with, uh, with the antiseps because they can yeah. do the adenoids along with the tonsils. So any Correct. advice regarding this? Yeah, when I was using coblation, um, I went along that same argument. 
because it was one instrument I could do both. Um, two things with that. One is that I found the coblator incredibly slow to take out big ad ones. Small ones were fine. I didn't see a huge advantage taking big ones out versus just what I yeah. What I actually do for adenoids is I use the micro debrider. I get them out really quickly and I can really shave it down to where I want it. Um, and then I just use a regular suction cautery to cauterize it, which is pretty inexpensive. I mean, you can argue that the micro debrider um, is, but again, it's just, I save time during the surgery. Um, the bottom line with the coblator was that even if I used it for small adenoids or if I used it just to coagulate after I took the you know, the, the adenoids out, whether I used a, you know, just a um, adenoid blade or if I used a, uh, you know, just to kind of scrape them, which I don't like doing because people get into the muscle with that, or if I use a micro debrider. The bottom line was that the advantage of the coblader in the adenoids did not outweigh the fact that I was just seeing more problems with the tonsils, more bleeding. So I just didn't think it was worth it. I mean, at the end of the day, how I took the adenoids out was less important to me than how much I was taking people back to the operating room with that jump from, you know, like I said, less than 1% bleeding to up to 8%. And that 8% wasn't just in my hands. Um, I actually, uh, you know, really kind of scoured the literature because I was not happy. And I found a few papers. Um, most important one to me was Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, I believe. Um, it was Philadelphia or Pennsylvania. I, I'm Pittsburgh, but I think it was Philadelphia. So they reported an 8% rate, exactly what I had reported, and said they had stopped doing it um, using the coblader. Another two institutions I found published their data with the coblader and said that their bleed rate was very acceptable, not any different than what it had been with other instruments, and they reported it at 8%. So the bottom line was they were accepting a fairly high bleed rate as okay, whereas, you know, most of us looked at 8% and said, no, no, that's not acceptable. That's not even our bleed rate on thyroids or, or neck dissections. I mean, so definitely not acceptable in tonsils, especially a procedure doing kids, and especially a procedure where it means going back to the operating room under general anesthesia. I mean, tonsil bleeds, even if they end up being really small vessels, look horrendous, you know, because they mix with saliva and patients bleed, and sometimes they bleed significantly. Not usually need a transfusion, but on rare occasions. So yes, um, coblator would be the thing that, you know, you say, I can use that on the adenoids, I can't use microceps. I just did not find the advantages there at all. Good question. I'm glad you mentioned it because I, I crossed my mind when I was talking about the tonsils and then I got off that subject. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Larentano, this is John again. If I may hey. make one quick point here to all the reps out there that um, may be thinking of taking the microceps out to a doctor and say, hey, use it just like a debakey. The point is, is that it does not have debakey teeth. They're going to have right. to understand that right up front and, and try yeah. and work through it, correct? Yeah, it's a huge learning curve. I mean, it's not huge, but it's like, you know, if you pick it exactly, if you pick it up and think it's going to be a debakey, it, the tissue is going to slip and you're going to get aggravated. Um, so, I mean, the first and foremost thing is, you know, that that's, I guess I call it a secondary function of it. I mean, I've used it to my advantage, but that's not the initial you know selling feature thing that's the part that takes i mean the first learning curve was learning how to cauterize with this you know do the coagulation do the cutting and then the second curve uh, i would say is using it as a debaking and i think once you get used to using it for cautery i think the second thing falls into suit pretty easily using it to grasp but yes there's going to be tissue that slips through i still think at some point we're going to be able to get some sort of teeth into this thing <laughs> And that would be just, a, I think would, for some people who struggle, it would be a game changer. A question that came in over the web. It also doesn't stick, by the way. Um, you know, people say, well, why not just use the bipolar? It's interesting. You don't see a lot of people using the bipolar um, to uh, work as a debakey. First of all, it, it, it's small, although you can use the longer ones, but they're not really ideal. Um, and secondly, you get some char on the end of it that will stick sticks to the tissue um, and and also I find sometimes the teeth on the uh, bipolar are a little abrasive and they end up um, you know sort of cutting the tissue so that I don't find them to be good graspers the way I use the microline where you can grasp cauterize let go and it doesn't stick it's like Teflon a question that came in over the web you mentioned power settings for the thyroidectomy could you yeah. confirm the optimal power settings for tonsillectomy <laughs> 
I've always used six. Six. Six for tonsils and four for uh, necks. And you get to the point where you know it's not on six. Just like with the bovie, you know that the setting is not right. When you go to cauterize something and, you know, you're like, well, something's not right here. This isn't working right. And then you look over and the settings are different or something's not connected. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, Terry, just a statement here. Um, yes, sir. Uh, somebody asked me a question yesterday about, hey, they're looking about potentially doing some uh, regional trainings. And you and I had spoken, I don't, I don't know, October, November, back uh, when, when some folks were in from out of town, and you had potentially expressed interest in traveling and, and teaching people stuff. Is that something yeah. that's still on the table? Definitely, yeah. All right. And not not trying to call you out, but it would be- In the, in the post-COVID okay. era. What's that? Would it also be okay if people reached out to you directly um, and had, had, if they had questions they can ask you, you know, after this is over? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. So, you guys my, for all you guys are probably, in probably my best, uh, you know, probably reach out to me at that circle help email. Very good. Okay. Yeah. So, I'll post that email for everybody on the on the chat here. Thank you. Yep. It's Arthur dot Laretano, not Laurentano, Laretano at circle dash health dot org.